And my very special guest, back for a second time, the lovely, fantastic Chloe Wesley. Chloe. Thank you. Great to be here. That's a much nicer intro than the BBC. Evil, evil taxpayers alliance girl. <laughs> what, is, is that what they say? Evil <laughs> no, tax? No, no. But it's a different tone, you can tell. It's all about the tone with the BBC, isn't it? They, they pretend that they are the nation's respected broadcaster and that, that they are required by their, their charter to be fair and balanced and neutral and they observe this to the, to the letter. And it's just bollocks. They are a communist indoctrination organisation. Well, I think you can... I, I'm not sure if it's deliberate or not, because I've spoken with a lot of producers who are really nice, really interesting, and just kind of surprised that there are some people that aren't on their political spectrum. So they sometimes speak to me as a, a bit of an oddity, um, you know, young person who's conservative-leaning, who's pro-Brexit. Mm. It's almost, not necessarily vindictive, but sometimes just one of surprise. Like, oh, there are young people who voted leave? How peculiar. And, you know, do you feel comfortable with that? And it's like, yeah, <laughs> a lot of people did. A lot of people feel the same way as me, but they don't speak up because they're afraid of what will happen and the abuse you get. It's, it's so much easier to be, to be left-wing, to believe in all the, all the things that the left, all, all its shibboleths, and to believe in anti-racism and anti-whatever, all the things that they they claim the moral high ground on. Um, it requires real courage, I think, to... I mean, a sort of cussed contramundum spirit to, to do what you've done. Even just to question, so to say, is socialism the best way of alleviating poverty? Even asking the question is met with disgust and surprise. Um, and so when we don't have these very frank conversations about, okay, how can we live in a society where everyone is free to live the best life, where everyone's safe, where um, we're making sure that we have good discourse, it's almost as though there's this lack of being allowed to question. So you don't even have to be conservative to be shunned. You, if you ask the wrong questions, um, or even like Brett Weinstein, who is a, a progressive professor, I was listening yeah. to his Rubin interview, he just questioned the idea of, actually, should we be telling um, white students to stay away from campus? Is that a good thing to do? He just questioned the methods, and by doing so, it was completely vilified. Um, and so there is this environment, but I think it's changing a little bit. Oh, please say it is. I think it is, because if there's one thing young people don't like, it's being told what to think. And when all of your teachers and authority figures are saying, you know, orange man, bad, you must be left wing, um, it might... Well, I've, I've heard from students getting in touch with me, make them go, hang on, is there a different side of the story? Where's the other side of the story? Um, and then they go on YouTube or Twitter or whatever and they find young conservatives or young libertarians um, who think the same way. And I think there is a real movement growing. But at the moment, it's very, it's a little bit hidden. It's a little bit, okay, I'll, um, I'll listen to the Delling Poll podcast, but I probably won't ever tell my friends that I think this way or that I feel conservative. Well, do you know, I had a, uh, a letter, because people, people contact me via the Delling Poll World website, and that's, that's how they respond to the podcast. And I got a, an email from the Muslim, my Muslim special friend. And my Muslim special friend said, I'm kind of pleased that you've that it's independent now. It's not a Breitbart production because it's slightly easier for me to recommend to my Muslim friends. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's nice, isn't it? But but for every special moment like that, which makes you really happy, and, and, and the, uh, I get other special moments. I get accosted all the time, as you know. Um, did I mention that last time? Anyway, I do. Oh, yeah. I get accosted by, by weird and wonderful looking, uh, weird people, but who are wonderful. And they tell me that often they are ex-leftists who I helped red pill, which is a really, it's, it, I mean, it's like, it's like converting a lesbian, isn't it? I mean, it's like, it's, it's, it's that kind <laughs> of male, you know, we, we all want to be able to do this. And, um, but those, so those moments make me happy. And at the same time, I think our work is, there is so much work to be done. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure... Look, Oxford and Cambridge have fallen. They really have. The, the, the orcs have, have swarmed through the... They, they, they've undermined Helm's Deep. They, they're, over the, they're over the ramparts. They're everywhere. That, it's gone. 
So uh, and that's quite a big deal, do you not think? I mean, I don't know. I think so. I think Cambridge was wrong to rescind their offer to Jordan Peterson. Yeah. But there are still those brilliant Oxford debates where they interview interesting people from all sides of politics. I think if those continue, which, there's which, hope. So which debates? What, the the o- Oxford Union debates. The Oxford Union. I, I think there's still hope in that there are enough students at these universities who won't put up with um, not being exposed to different ideas. And I think it was either Oxford or Cambridge where Steve Bannon, there was a lot of pressure to stop him speaking, but they, they, they hosted the speech. So I hope that, because I do think that if you disagree with someone, the best way to convince others that their ideas are wrong is to challenge them, to debate them. If you try to ban them or disassociate them from debate and discourse, people people wonder, like, what are you so afraid of? Like, I, what, yeah. I agree with you, but um, actually your point doesn't quite stand, because I think it was the Cambridge Union. Cambridge Union is a separate body from the university, and same okay. with the Ox- Oxford Union. They're not part of the, of, of the university, technically. Mm-hmm. Um, so they and and the, the guy at Cambridge Union I know because I because I, I have chats with him on, on the rare occasions where I go and go and speak at the union. He, he he makes a point of how they really pride themselves on on free speech and not banning people, and they resist it when the when the university starts imposing um, tries to make it difficult for them by saying you know there's going to be trouble or whatever. He will then hire security to make sure that the the debate goes ahead, mm. rather than banning the speaker for health and safety reasons. What a legend! He, he's an absolute legend. Um, I can't remember his name; otherwise, I'd praise him. Maybe, he, maybe he wants to be anonymous anyway. But he he does a good job at, at the Cambridge Union. But I think generally, I mean, y- you saw how the university authorities, rather than being embarrassed by the what was it, the theology department? I think it was the uh, band divinity divinity mm. department. Rather rather than than feel embarrassed about it and say, well, look, it's a, a it's a divinity department's decision it's not it's not the university the university doubled down by saying mm. yeah we approve of this because he wants to appear with somebody wearing a, a I, heart, I heart islamophobia t-shirt well how can you police if we're going to be judged on people we stood next to in a selfie we're all going to be in deep deep trouble aren't we yeah well I, it's, it's a tough one because if i saw someone wearing that t-shirt i probably wouldn't want to get a photo taken um, oh, but that's 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 career safety but, and that's caution ra- rather but, than. But also, yeah, who knows? Was was P- Dr. Peterson given an opportunity to explain at all? I don't think so, um, and I don't think. Yeah, I don't think this has done a lot of good for Cambridge's PR as an institution. I had a couple of people get in touch with me and say, quite young in high school, that like, I thought Cambridge was the be all and end all. Yeah. I might not even apply now. Um, because I'm a young person interested in ideas, and if they're behaving in this way, is that so, right? You, yeah, you actually I had, had a couple. Pe- I had a couple of people. I don't want to mention their name because of the environment it's like to be a young conservative. Um, but that was fascinating. So I also think that because students are paying for tuition fees back, basically a graduate tax after they graduate, there is a bit of a consumer mentality. And I wonder if we have a bit more of a free market with universities and. There could be some universities that pop up that are dedicated to free speech that say, we are the free speech university. I think you'll get a lot of young people wanting to apply there and avoid the ones that are, you know, shutting down debates. It might take a very long time, though. Um, So in the meantime, I think the best way forward is for young conservatives to hold debates, hold events. Um, I think Turning Point UK is really, really exciting. I'm excited about Turning Point. And isn't it interesting how much flack they got when, when the, the news started coming out, not only do they get, get some very nasty flack from the, from the left and, and people posting fake Twitter posts from different alleged branches of Turning Point, which didn't exist, but I was also interested to see that some of our number, some people in, of, of our persuasion, started kind of distan- distancing themselves slightly mm. from Turning Point. They were slightly embarrassed or they didn't feel it was a good... A bit like you saying you wouldn't stand next to somebody wearing... It would be photographed somebody wearing... It's, it's, everyone wants to, to, to show that they're not the bad right-wing person that the, <laughs> left, the left talks about. And I think, this is, I think this is cowardly and unhealthy. I think it's also a bit of a challenge, though, isn't it? Because there is a gap in the conservative side of things when it comes to mobilising young people. And I think that there is almost a bit of a hesitance to support Turning Point because 
they're like a challenger bank. They're not a normal political organisation. They're not one of your established campaigns or think tanks. They're not run by Westminster. It is very punchy. It is run by young people. The memes are brilliant. The content is punchy and interesting. Um, you know, not afraid to say Corbyn's a terrorist sympathiser. Whereas if you look at the conservative youth kind of social media accounts, they're very, very boring. So I think some of it might also be about territory. Like, well, no, we're, we're the conservative yes. voice. And, and who are these challenges coming in to try and take our people? Look, I think that actually a youth movement shouldn't be run by a political party. I think it totally. should. Otherwise, then, then you have to support like a party line. And I, I think it's a positive thing for the Conservative Party long term, if they become conservative, to have a group like Turning Point going to universities, challenging the, the, the left wing group thing, having debates, exposing young people to these ideas. That's how you're going to sway people, not by you know this kind of pint and politics, like come out leafleting with us kiddos and we'll buy you a drink afterwards. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's really patronising, isn't Quite it? Patronizing. And, and you're absolutely right about, I, I liked your line about if the Conservative Party ever becomes conservative. <laughs> Because at the moment, that's looking pretty unlikely, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, how, yeah. How would you, you... This is a problem, isn't it? That, that any, any youth movement affiliated with, with the Conservative Party is going to be bound by the, the, the current um, ideological status of the Conservative Party, which is currently squish, or, 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 or even worse than squish, actually. I mean... The, what really depresses me about the Conservative Party, uh, apart from Brexit, which we're going to talk about in a moment, is that it seems to have embraced all the, all the ideas of the left on, on, on gender, so-called gender, on diversity, on... I mean, you, you, you see women, female... Uh, you see female Conservative MPs playing the same feminist cards that, that, that Jess Phillips plays, J Jess Phillips being a Labour MP. And you're thinking, hang on a second, I, I, I don't believe in, in this in the identity politics game. This, conservatives should not be doing this at all. Mm. Not at all. Well, you're not, I don't think you are helping women by perpetuating myths like the gender pay gap. I actually think that's incredibly damaging because you're actually limiting people's vision about what they can achieve. I mean, I was told as a young person um, that I'd find it really difficult, that I'd face discrimination, that the world was kind of pitched against me. And if you're, if you're telling young women this, maybe they won't apply for that promotion. Maybe they won't apply for that job. You know, I, I would have loved to have heard someone say, you know what, you are living in the best possible time in human history to be a human being, to be a woman with all the freedoms that you have, unlike other countries right now. You have the biggest opportunity to make something of your life. You have opportunities that your grandparents didn't have, that your parents didn't have. Like, this is what really fascinates me about young people being very left wing, is that we have it better than any other group in human history. If you look at all the societies in human history and all societies today, you know, Western countries like Britain, like Australia, where I was born, these are the best countries to be in. The opportunities are endless and there's so much exciting stuff happening. Why try and tear it down and pitch yourself to ideas which are going to actually regress and, and take us back massively? Um, I, I don't understand it, but, you know, once again, is it because young people aren't exposed to the other side of the story or is it because, yeah, they're only hearing one side of the argument? I really don't know. Um, but I'm excited. I, I want to do a bit more, actually, of just speaking to fellow young people who aren't stupid, um, but who have predominantly been reading and taught to write essays about things in a way that's, you know, a declinism. Um, so they're being taught that the world's declining and things are getting worse. And I, I loved Matt Ridley's um, book, The Rational Optimist, and you know, people like Steven Pinker who explain on all of these metrics, life is getting better. So maybe you should tell young people that they're lucky <laughs> and that they should be excited, not depressed and afraid about the future. I totally agree with you. And I think, I think particularly with, with young women, that, that they need somebody like you, you know, basically, Chloe, you need to be the role model for your generation. For the, for, that, is, for the, that is a very heavy burden. <laughs> yeah, but, but Chloe, if, if not you, who? I think there's many of us that can do this. Are there? Yeah. Because I, I, I can't tell you what, um, what a joy it is meeting somebody of your generation. How old are you? 24. You're 24. 
you're like, well, you're a child. Se- yeah. Second stage millennial. They call us the iGen because we're the generation that had iPhones in high school. Very different psychology, apparently, to the other millennials who didn't have social media in high school. You see, if I were, if I were your age group, I would be so grateful to meet a Chloe Wesley where I could just just have banter and, and conversation and uh, w- without, without any worries that you were about to report me as a kind of rapist or a, you know. Well, you, you've actually committed 10 hate crimes already have in I? this podcast. Yeah, I've been taking notes. <laughs> Se- several micro, micro But do you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, you see, I, I really worry that what I hear, correct me if I'm wrong, that in some universities it is now so bad that men, w- frankly, would rather stay at home and have a wank than, 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 than risk, than jeopardise their, their security mm. by, by attempting to, to have sexual relationship, relations with a woman. Well, they do say that people of my generation are having less sex and drinking less and doing and smoking less and all these things. I'm not sure why that is. Because um, you're straight edges. <laughs> I, I hadn't heard of this well, concept of the straight edge, straight edge. Yeah, well, I guess it's a bit of a rebellion from our parents' generation who were doing lots of drinking and, and really excited to be free. Look, I think this is a really difficult topic because no, no one wants to talk about it. Um, I worry that... I read... So with the Me Too movement, um, some of the stories I read and I thought, this is, like, quite shocking, like oh my goodness, like, stop behaving like animals. You know, if you're in a position of power, maybe don't, you know, be such an animal and prey on young people. But then on the other side, I read all these stories of accounts which just were described as, like, a um, assault or something like that, but just sounded to me like um, men being just quite awkward and not knowing what to do. And at the end of the date, you know, kiss on the cheek, like, oh, no, I don't like you that way. And, and it sounded, it, a lot of the, some of the descriptions would just seem like awkward dating yeah, and and I I think we have to draw a line between you know predatory behaviour and just the awkwardness of dating, where sometimes men and women will make a move on each other because they get their own signal, and then someone says no, and that's the end of it. That is the problem, isn't it? That that it, there are no no rules for sexual relations, and and one occasion's pass can result in a a score and a happy situation for both both parties, and the, and the other other paths can lead to upset and I mean what are we going to do we're we going to change the rules where you can't make embarrassing passes anymore and, and, and so people aren't going to get the kind of those random moments of sex that that brighten up one's life and one's youth I think if you ask a lot of people whether they'd rather meet someone have a conversation and flirt and then find out that they like each other or if they'd rather you know scroll through an application of faces yeah. and meet someone that way then the natural way I think is there's something bit nicer about it um i think two things need to happen first of all t- you know teaching young boys you know here's ha- here's how to date Here, here's here's some really good um pointers about how to date how to pick up on signals when he or she likes you um and the best way to go about that and is it playing with your your hair and your earrings <laughs> Is that what it maybe although that can just be sometimes if you're in a nervous situation I do that in job interviews sometimes um, when I or like at TV interviews if you're nervous sometimes you so maybe if they're, but if they're nervous on a date they might like you right. um, but also teaching young women like here's how you deal with the situation um, if someone says something to you and you don't like it perhaps instead of tweeting about it or going to the school principal or the school administrator you tell them to their face don't talk to me like that, or I'm not interested. And resolve it when you can, one-to-one, as opposed to immediately seeking someone external or in a position of authority to reprimand someone for a mistake. Um, but it, you know, we couldn't have this conversation in many other forums, and I'd be afraid to have this conversation on, for example, Sky News or something like that, yeah. because you just don't want to offend anyone. You don't want to be seen to be belittling sexual assault or anything like that. Um, and I think we've become a little bit more prudish as a culture as well, maybe publicly, not wanting to talk about dating or sex as much. Um, we had this revolution where everyone was just excited that they could talk about you know, sex and watch it in movies and stuff. And now maybe, maybe my generation are a bit more prudish and don't want to talk about it in public. Although, I tell you what's weird. I, I, I have actually given up watching the BBC generally because I think it's just, it's just evil. 
and and that includes actually almost worse than the news is is the drama because the news it, it's it's pretty overt what they're doing that the, the, the whole decision about what they how they curate the news and it's always about bigging up public services and, and bigging up bigger government and and slagging off anything that's to do with free markets or free speech or whatever um, but the drama and the comedy and things like that I think are much more insidious and I've noticed quite a lot of I say I don't watch it. I obviously have to watch a bit because I'm a TV reviewer. But there are quite a lot of things celebrating women's sexuality and 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 all, all kind of yes, we women can do whatever we like because we're free and independent spirits. You know, Fleabag, for example. Um, so you've got this 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 sort of se- celebration of, of sexualized women's culture at the same time. This this prudery. In fact, somebody told me that they had this problem problem with 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 a with a girl at work, who was um, really really flirty and and kind of huggy and 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 you know sort of like signalling of availability, and yet at the, and and talking about her sex life and stuff, and yet at the same time really politically correct. There seems to be this this dangerous mix with that with your generation, not not you, but a lot of a lot of women. They they want it both ways. They want they want me too, but they want flea bag. Interesting, isn't it? Um, I can't remember who I heard it from, but someone said, you know, "I don't need a lecture on morality from Hollywood in reference to all these speeches and everything." And I think what they were referring to was all of the kind of sexual imagery in movies and in the music industry as well. But then this this you know also you know, movement for you know respecting women and not sexualizing women. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the answer. Um, I have friends who are a bit more socially conservative and say that they think that maybe the sexual revolution's gone a little bit too far. Um, you know, too many people are having too many sexual partners, and that's making them unhappy. Um, and also, I have like libertarian friends who say that everything should be you know, free and, and open, and we should have nudity on TV all the time. So uh, there's got to be a happy medium in society where. Women and men are free to express themselves. The LGBT community are free to express themselves. One of the only, you know, Western countries are one of the, some of the only societies where, you know, it's not illegal to love someone of the same sex or even you know, marry them. I know there are some people that aren't happy about that, but I think it's a good thing. I think that, you know, we've reached a, a point in time where you can choose who you love. And good, that's a yeah, freedom, you know, with know. free markets. We talk about free markets and free speech, but one freedom that is very modern and very recent that isn't in other countries is the freedom to choose who you love. If I was born in a different country, my dad would decide who I married and you know, had sex with my whole life. That, that's, that's been the norm in human societies. Now we're a bit more free, but we, we have all these other problems, don't we? <laughs> I don't know. Speaking as a father of a daughter, Chloe, I think actually I'd like to, to, to maintain that tradition that the father decides. Oh, the, really? Well, I, I, I just, I'm, dreading, I'm dreading the creatures that she's going to bring home one day. Appalling. They're going to be really annoying, aren't they? And, I, and, I, and I'll know that they're only after one thing, because I've been there myself. <laughs> well, you've got to hope that you've raised her well enough to be a good judge of character. That's the best thing you can do. Yeah, well, they, I, I suppose it's true, isn't it, that girls tend to want to marry their fathers one way or another. So I suppose that she's going to end up with a, a, a very podcaster. fine, a very <laughs> fine, fine young man. We should talk, shouldn't we, about the bad shit that's going down today. Um, this is, you called it Brexit Betrayal Day. And that's what it is, isn't it? Mm. Um, this is the day for, for special friends who are not aware. Um, actually, no, well, how would, you, how would you be aware? You don't know when this is recorded. We're recording this on Friday... The 29th of March, the day that Britain was supposed to leave the European Union. Yeah, but we're not, are we? No. We, give me your analysis of why we're not leaving. Why we're not leaving. Well, there's a majority of voters who want out of the EU, who don't want Britain to join a European super state because the majority of voters have common sense. Um, And then all of the politicians said, okay, we'll implement the referendum results. And then they went to a general election and said to their constituents and their voters, vote for me, I'll deliver Brexit. 80% of people voted for political parties campaigning for Brexit. Labour was committed to Brexit. 
And so then you have this bizarre situation where you look at the parliament today and MPs are saying we need to delay Brexit, we need to have a second referendum, we need to have a softer Brexit. I mean, there's what, what are they doing? Who do they think they are? There's been two votes on this now. People are clear about what they want to happen. And I just don't know at this point if the political establishment will let Britain leave the EU. I do, well, I don't think they will. Short, it, if they can possibly stop it, they will. But I've been reading Twitter, as I do, to get my information. And I've been seeing this morning, for example, various think tankers, people, people pr- pretty sound on Brexit, who are saying things like, look, no one wants m- Brexit more than I do, but regretfully, I, I'm going to have to say that we really should, the MPs really should vote for Theresa May's um, dog turd rolled in glitter withdrawal agreement because it's the only way we're going to get an, even a semblance of Brexit. Um, and I'm not with them. I, 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 I don't buy into that argument. Do you? I, I don't. Um, I'm not an MP, so I don't have to make this difficult decision about whether to vote for the deal no, or not. No, but you are a think tanker. But I, I'm a think tanker. I, I just think this deal is terrible. And this is not the final agreement. This is an agreement to start the next stage of negotiations. And this agreement means that at the next stage, we are placing all of the cards in the EU's hands. We're essentially entering the negotiations from a position of great weakness where the UK will be forced to sign up to sign up to any kind of agreement to avoid this backstop, which is essentially the EU um, keeping Britain in the customs union and deciding on a lot of rules and regulations on behalf of the British people. Keeping Britain in, in custom, the customs union via Northern Ireland. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so it's a separate part of the United Kingdom will be disunited yeah. and, and essentially a an ongoing member of the European Union's customs union. Exactly. Which is, I can see why people who believe in in Great Britain, in the United Kingdom, find this very annoying. But it seems to me that there are many more faults than that with the withdrawal agreement. There are so many. Um, The one that's not talking about enough is all of the uh, agreements on defence and cooperation on defence. The European Army. The European Army. It's essentially the EU... European countries aren't meeting their NATO spending requirements. Trump came over and said, you should meet your NATO spending requirements. Instead of... I think they have put in more money into NATO, but instead of investing in NATO, the leaders of the EU have this ridiculous fantasy project dream to have their own European army, which essentially would be a duplication of NATO, but at the exclusion of America. Now, I thought NATO would be a very important, was a very important organization because it showed, particularly Russia, that America and Europe were united. There was an agreement there. I'm really concerned about this European Defence Force because it's a duplication of resources, which is unnecessary. We've yeah. already got NATO, but also it really is a kick in the teeth to America. Who American taxpayers have been funding European defence for a yeah. very long time. And there is absolutely no gratitude. There's no recognition of the, the important part that not just Americans played, but also Commonwealth soldiers played in you know, achieving peace in Europe. Um, yeah, and we now, gave you all the shit jobs, didn't we? Yeah, I'm, yeah, so, well, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about di- the Dieppe, that's, the that's Dieppe very, landings, and I'm sorry about well. It's very kind of you to say, thank you. Um, but it's 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 really shocking. It's really shocking, and nobody's talking about defence. Um, it's just flown. It's it's gone by the radar. So it, it's got all these agreements in defence that we don't want to be a part of. That she signed us up to. Um, and there's, there's several things wrong with the deal. It's £40 billion of taxpayers' money that she's offered for permission to continue to negotiate. That, that's extraordinary, isn't it? It's extraordinary. That, that, to put that in context, that's more than the UK's defence budget. Yeah. <laughs> extraordinary. It, it is extraordinary. And it, it's, it's depressing when you see even ardent Brexiteers and articulate, intelligent Brexiteers like Jacob Rees-Mogg reluctantly acceding to this mm. this idea that the withdrawal agreement is... I, I think what it is, is that, and, and I, I understand this, there is a fear that if this does, doesn't get through, that the establishment will just stop this Brexit altogether. And I don't think 
I, I think that we, we, we should get Brexit. There should be a clean break from the EU. Um, and I think that Britain could leave without a deal very successfully. Yeah. But the MPs won't vote for it. And so it's a difficult situation because it's like, well, do I vote for this deal, which is going to mean we have a really crap deal when we Brexit, just to get a little bit of divergence from the EU? Or do I risk total convergence with the EU forever? I mean, that's, I think, that's what the government is telling MPs. Like, you need to either vote for this deal or there'll be no Brexit at all. Right. And it's really shocking. It's really shocking because this, this, you know, this manifesto, the Conservative manifesto, which the government are now supposed to deliver, explicitly said that no deal would be better than a bad deal and that they will take Britain out of the single market and customs union. Yes. I, the analogy I used was it's a bit like a, you're playing a game of chess with the other side and you're winning and suddenly the other player upturns the board and throws the pieces on the floor and what the people on our side of the argument are doing the, these these think tankers uh, that they're and, and politicians they're saying right let's put the pieces back on the board where they were and carry on playing chess to show them that we're going to win this game or or that some of them are saying well we've lost haven't we i mean the, the we the <laughs> The, the board's been overturned, all the pieces have flown around the room, we can't do anything about it. But it seems to me that if the other side are playing dirty, cheaty games, you cannot, you cannot go on playing by the rules anymore, by the old rules. The, this is a declaration of war by the political establishment against the, against the people. And for me, this is a Magna Carta moment. This is, this is, this is, one, this is a situation where the political elite has so betrayed the trust of the electorate that the British constitutional system is no longer fit for purpose. Because, I, I mean, I, I run out of, I, I can't think of how many erudite articles explaining patiently why it is that, that we have no choice but to accept withdrawal agreement because numbers, because, because this and that. But then I go and speak to the people in the streets, the people who actually voted for Brexit, not the political class, people who don't, who don't watch the BBC anymore because they're sick of it, people who don't read the mainstream media anymore because it's, it's just full of, of, of lies. And they haven't changed their view. They haven't, they, they, they haven't, they haven't suddenly gone, well, if the, if the grown-ups are telling us that we can't have our Brexit, then I guess, I guess we just have to accept the verdict. They're not thinking that. They're thinking, no, we voted for it. We've got to have it. Hmm. Absolutely. And the, the, a lot of the coverage has been journalists speaking about the process, about the votes, procedural. It's all about And procedural. also almost a comical way, like, oh, isn't it hilarious that John Burko did this? What a lad. Um, do you realise how serious this is? This country voted for independence and, the, and some politicians are trying to stop it. That's a very serious time in British history. This is not about procedure. This is not about, you know, it, it memes and, and isn't it funny, although I do love memes. Um, but the coverage I don't think has represented fully this monumental moment in this history and how serious it is for a group of MPs to come together and completely betray the main promise they put to people at an election and a referendum. I mean, it's extraordinary. And they keep on saying, well, people need to vote again to confirm their decision. Uh, they voted again in the 2017 election, and it's not their fault that MPs lied about their intentions to respect the result. That People have made it clear to politicians what they want to happen. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen from here. Will the deal pass today? Maybe it will. Then we might have a new leader. I don't know what that new leader could do, though, because, as I said, the deal ties Britain's hands and weakens the position, yes. whereas leaving without a deal means that Britain's a third country, so negotiating as a third country with the European Union as opposed to uh, yeah, tied into this um, yeah. withdrawal agreement. I think that would be a much stronger position. Well, I didn't know, actually, or I wasn't sure what your position was before I, I, I came to speak to you. How come, how, why are you so sound? Is, is, <laughs> I think it's easy to be ideologically pure when your job is not on the line. So I don't have to worry about my, um, my seat or my pension or anything like that or my position within a party. I can be on the outside ideologically pure. Um, and as well, I don't think that everyone who is saying we have to vote for the deal now 
is just a careerist. I think there are some who are just careerists, but there are also others who I know really genuinely believe that, look, this is the best we're going to get and I'd rather we can, you know, leave the EU a little bit than not at all. So I, I think there are some people who are, who are good people who, are, you know, agree with us and want a no deal, but they have come to a different conclusion to me. Um, and that's disappointing. Yeah. I have a theory on this, which is that, and I used to, I used to be on, on the, the staff of the, the Telegraph in the, years when, in, the, in the years when it was a decent newspaper, when it was a conservative newspaper, which, is, which it's really not anymore. I mean, it's bought into all that SJW stuff. Um, there are still some, there are a few sound. Well, few Al- sound Alistair ones. Heath. Yeah. I mean, Alistair Heath is God. Yeah. There's no question about that. And Charles Moore, always worth reading. Alison Pearson, wish I could get her on the podcast. Ditto Alistair Heath. Yeah, I mean, there are there are pockets of sadness, I agree. Um, but what I was there saying, yeah, when I was on the, on the, on the Telegraph, I, I used to really, really hate what's technically known as page one. There were, there were always, it would always be led by a political story, which is government to roll out this or that initiative. And it was all about what you mentioned earlier, it was all about process. It was all about the political class taking their statements as, as, as news in, in themselves, just, just what they say. That, it seemed to me at the time, already buys into the idea that, w- that whatever government does is important and good and necessary, um, which I don't believe at all. But I think that people who report on Westminster, particularly, get, they go native. They, they, they too start to believe in the system and the, and, and the importance of the system, which is why you get think tankers who, after all, are, are based in, West, in, in Westminster and they hang out with MPs a lot and, and they, they like to think that, that politicians listen to what they say. Um, they, they too get tainted by the idea that, it's, that, that we have this constitutional system. Well, I mean, you know, an unwritten constitution. We have a we have traditions which which work and which make Britain great. And I don't think they've made the imaginative or intellectual leap to understanding the situation now, where you've got more than seventeen point four million very angry people who are are real and they're out there, and they're looking at the shenanigans in Westminster and the, in the newspapers, and they're thinking, well, I'm not buying to this shit. I voted Brexit. Where is it? Sorry, that was a bit of a long... Um, no, it was, no, it was spot on. And today of all days, um, I was speaking to Marc Francois, who... We like him. We really. like him. Well, he's very funny and he's, um, he's one of us. And he did this brilliant interview where he was talking about, I'm in the, um, I was in the army and I don't quit or something like that about May's deal and changing his mind. Um, and he said something really, really interesting, which was that a lot of... Brexiteers might not have been tuning in to all of the procedural stuff, all the votes and everything, but they know that March 29th was the date. And if they look at the newspapers on March 29th and we haven't left yet, that's when you see a really big problem starting to happen. That's when you see a lot of anger. And I feel the need to speak to leave voters on this podcast and elsewhere and say, you know, we need a peaceful revolution. We need to make this happen. Um, yes, they might get away with stopping this this time around, but I don't think ideas as important as universal suffrage just go away. The fact that one group of MPs um, vote to stop this happening doesn't mean that we are wrong in our ideals or that the ideals are going to go away. Yeah. I think this is going to happen one way or another. I um. I watched the the Suffragettes movie recently. It was pretty good. And what was interesting was hearing the MPs' speeches made about women not shouldn't have the vote. So they're not of sound judgment. They are easily misled by propaganda. And I to thought, be fair, though, Chloe. <laughs> Come on, I mean, behave, behave. Um, but I thought, oh my goodness, that's exactly what they're saying about Leave voters. They're they that's they're not of sound judgment. They are easily misled. They don't understand matters of state. I think people in this country outside of Westminster have a lot of common sense 
And I don't think a university degree is a pretty good indicator of wisdom and intelligence. Actually, at this point, if I was smarter, I would have done an apprenticeship because then I would be earning while I'm learning. But also there's different kinds of intelligence. If you're running a business or you're self-employed or you're raising a family on a low income, you're making decisions every day about risk and reward and about budgets. And, and the, the, risk, the risks are very, very real. And you probably are better placed to make risk judgments than some, you know, Cambridge grad Guardian columnist on 40K who's never really had to worry about not being able to pay their rent. I'm very glad you said that because I've been getting a lot of hate on Twitter recently. I mean, not that that's exactly news, <laughs> newsflash. Um, and one of the things that the Remainers and the left, actually, they're pretty much the same thing. That it, It's surprising. There are, there are some sound legs of tears, but they're, they're not heard from enough, no. I think. No, I, th- th- I, I met some, some Lexiteers on the, that's Labour voting Brexiteers. Yeah. yeah, I met some of them on the, on the march. And, and I considered the best thing for me about Brexit is the way that it has broken down the old divides. That it's not about really about, quite about left and right or, or, or any, anymore. That, that, that what I mean is one finds oneself in alliance with people that hitherto might have rejected one as a, as a kind of, you know, people in Sunderland might have looked at me as a kind of metropolitan, what they see as a toff, and, and, and thought that they weren't on the, we weren't on the same side. But we have been united by this. But, yeah, going back to my point, the, what I find is that the hatred is very much about how dare you, how dare you, with your, from your privileged background, say that things are going to have to get worse before they get better. You know, you can afford the, the austerity and misery caused by, by Brexit. In other words, they're trying to say that they speak on behalf of the poor. But actually the poor voted for Brexit and they knew what they were going to get when they voted for Brexit. They, weren't, they, were, they, they knew they were possibly going to take an economic hit. Well, I don't think it's as big as, as, as the Remain propagandists made mm. out. But they're trying to claim the mantle of, of, of ordinary poor working folk. When ordinary poor working folk just hate Remainers. Yeah, well, it's very Marxist because a lot of Marxist thought is about Forced the poor proletariats who are too stupid to rise up. They need us elite bureaucrats to come in, order society because we know best, essentially. There's a lot of writing, I think it was Lenin or Stalin wrote a lot of passages which are very similar to the Remainer arguments about kind of working class people not being able to have the intellect to surpass, you know, merely complaining about their condition. They're not able to to do things. Um, It's a very pessimistic way of looking at humanity, first of all, because it means that you think that someone's economic position determines how wise or brilliant they are. I just disagree with that. I, you know, I, I wasn't born into, you know, gr- you know, great family. I didn't go to Eton or anything. I had a pretty good upbringing because it was in Australia, a Western country. But, um, you know, just because we didn't have a lot of money doesn't mean that we weren't smart or, or brilliant. And, and I hate this because they're, they're really picking on people as well who have no right of reply. Like it's, you have like th- these people, some of these people, they have these TV shows, like comedians or you know, these radio shows or they're politicians and they go out there and they talk about leave voters being stupid or ignorant or bigoted or whatever. And wh- who, how, can the, how can people respond to that? They're sitting on the couch. The only thing they can do is tweet at them and say, how dare you call me that? Um, and then they complain that they're getting a ton of abuse online and how dare voters express their displeasure. So I really, I don't know how we fix this. Um, I don't know how we reconnect people to Parliament. I just, I'm really, really angry and I'm really, really scared. I d- well, I think you're right to be both. I don't think that we can restore people's faith in Parliament until Parliament is genuinely representative of the people, which is why I go back to, I, I think this is a, a Magna Carta moment. I, 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 certainly never in my, my lifetime has there been as big a gulf between the electorate and the people who are supposedly representing them. And, 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 and by that I mean not just the political class, but the, the other members of the West, Westminster bubble, so the big, the big city, the city firms, the law firms, um, the, uh, the BBC, the, the, the mainstream media. They, they seem to be completely out of touch with what's happening in the country. And that's not a... I mean, we, we haven't got 
got into a gilet jaune situation not yet. yet. But I'm not sure that... I, I'm not sure I buy into the analysis that in Britain we don't do revolutions. Um, I mean, we had a civil war. And I'm not advocating for a civil war, but we, we have been there. Well, this is a country... This is an ideas revolution country. I mean, the, the, I, I was really drawn to reading British history when I was young. I was fascinated by just the intellectual history as well. This was one of the, the sparks, the, the flame for the Enlightenment was lit in the United Kingdom and across Europe. Mainly by and the how, Scots. Yeah, mainly by the Scots. Love Scots. They're, um, yeah, well, they're bloody useless now, though, aren't they? <laughs> what, what, I mean, apart oh, we've, from, we've got some good ones. No, apart from, okay, Mark Miller. Yeah. Who else is there apart from Mark Miller? I definitely know some Scots. Um, I can't think of any now. No, there oh, are no, some. The of course, there are. Of course, some great. No, no, there are great. There are some great. Look, look. I love Michael Gove for whatever you know, and and I uh, Andrew Neil's great. Oh, the, Andrew Neil's fantastic. There, there, there are some. There are some amazing Scots. Fraser Nelson, my 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 spectator editor, but I suppose what I mean is Scotland ain't quite the intellectual powerhouse that it was at the time of of Hume and mm. and all these all these great. But isn't isn't Thinkers. it sad that from you know, Europe was where it was all happening, the ideas revolution, and especially in Britain, and now look at the decline. You know, these these ideals about individualism and freedom and liberty, all of these ideals seem to have been completely lost, and now the intellectual class are pushing us into this European superstate, which is very bureaucratic and doesn't respect enlightenment ideals or freedom or individuals at all it's it's communism by by the back door it's it's just communism with without the supermarket uh shelves being empty so we've got this i think that that's that's what they've that's how they've won this time they've they've bought off people with abundance they bought them off with ho- holidays you know easy jet, jet flights and stuff and and white goods but actually our freedoms have declined markedly I think in the last ten or twenty years, we're being we're being sucked into this socialistic, politically correct entity. And I, you see, I, I think that that even if there hadn't been a thing called the European Union that we'd been part of, we would have come to a similar um, crisis that we're experiencing now. That it's the the people who voted for Brexit are not just voting about the European Union, they're, they're voting about all the attached values. They're, they're, so they're voting about identity politics, which is very much built into the... And they're voting about against political correctness. They're vo- voting against having their memes banned by by EU fiat. They're voting against all these all these things. It's not just about the EU. It's about, it's about how we live our lives, isn't it? Mm. Well, it was about freedom and control. And I was at a um, conservative policy forum event and the questions were, how do we restore faith in public institutions? And I said, at the moment, public institutions don't look like they're there to serve individuals that pay for them. They're there to serve the bureaucrats that work in them. And that's not right. And if you want people to trust the political system, give them more control over their lives. You know, a lot of the resentment is very high levels of taxation, very high levels of intervention. Um, they want to ban, you know, meal deals and, and sweets at supermarket counters. It's so weird. And like the, if you take away people's freedoms this much and expect and, and then expect them to as well be okay with you ignoring their votes, uh, you've got another thing coming. <laughs> yeah. People want more control over their lives because they're not stupid. They can run their lives perfectly well. They can run their businesses perfectly well without the government saying they need a worker on the board. Um, and I, this distrust in ordinary people is very interesting to me um, because it goes against everything I believe in. And I do think that human beings in general are you know, quite remarkable. And I don't think that you can disregard huge sections of the population as being ignorant or stupid or whatever. Um, I think everyone's capable of, of, of their flourishing in their own way, whatever that is. Um, and the current kind of zeitgeist in public debate is less about empowering individuals to flourish and more about how can we grow the state because people need our help. Yeah, yeah. You're going now to go and go to some SOAS students with some, with some searching questions which they're going to be incapable of answering. <laughs> um, and you're going to hope that they're not going to egg you or anything like that. I hope not. I, I think it would be really interesting um, because I like speaking to socialists and, and young lefties because 
sometimes I learn something first of all about how how they've come to that what they've read but also it often surprises them that a fellow kind of young person wearing you know boots and leather jacket um considers what, what themselves you, what, to be conservative so I'm going to ask them? ask questions um ask you know what's your political beliefs um what kind of political books do you read at the moment do you listen do you read the news or do you listen to podcasts because I have a feeling that more young people are listening to podcasts oh, um, oh please please let it be said <laughs> Well, not just yours. People like you know, Russell Brand and, and that kind of. Oh, fuck! I'm not fuck Russell Brand. <laughs> He's very popular, though. And yeah, I know. We need. We don't really have the conservative podcasts down pat yet. Like in America, they've got Joe Rogan, uh, Ruben, all these amazing yeah, podcasts. I am it. I you just, are. I, you are but, at the moment. You are our the, sole podcast. <laughs> I don't. I don't know how to get the word out though because I'm only on Twitter. I mean, I don't really use. How do I tell people that 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 where my podcast is? Good question. Well, I think you've got to get on YouTube. I think... I want lot, YouTube. Yeah, I think um, as well film them. If you film them as a video... Do you think th- so? I think that would be really fun for people to watch. Yeah. Because then they can see our facial expressions when we're making jokes. That's true. That's <laughs> true. Actually, I think I might do that. I might... Do, the next podcast you and I do together, because it would be a shame not to... I mean, look, people like hot chicks. <laughs> no, you, you, I mean, you know, let's be honest. That is how the world works, I think. Well, I hope they like my ideas too. Yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah, obviously, like it's nice with it, with packaging, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> I think people like um, to see that you're interested and passionate and yeah. smiling. I'm very smiley, which might not come across. No, no, in I like the way I liked the way I like the way you do you do Twitter. You are very good at passive aggression. <laughs> you are very good at people. People come and say, "Yeah, fuck off, Australian bitch. We hate you, Nazi." <laughs> and you go, "Thank you. Have then, a nice have day. A, have a nice day." <laughs> And I think annoys them more. I think it does. <laughs> so well done, Chloe. Thank you. Um, right, you can annoy some SOA students, I and um, yeah, um, thank you for appearing on the podcast. Thanks and next for time me. we'll have visuals. Yes, let's do it. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, this was the Delling Pod with me, James Delling Pod, and my very special guest, Chloe Wesley of the Taxpayers Alliance, Fire Australia. Bye bye.